So thank you. It's a pleasure for me to be here and to tell you about the uh, basic research needs uh, future for nuclear energy workshop. I will say that uh, this is the first sort of hearing we've given of some of the, the PRDs that were developed there. And what I hope to do during this, this uh, presentation is to try and convey some of the excitement uh, that the, the people that participated in that workshop, that excitement that they generated and the enthusiasm and the new ideas they brought about where they could actually for or advance uh, the basic science that we need uh, to ensure a successful future for nuclear energy. So just to remind you that the people involved in it were uh, Kelly Byersmith from Idaho, uh, the co-chairs were Michael Buch uh, Michelle Buchanan and Aurora Clark. You'll see there the charge, and I'm not going to actually read it for you, but really it was to say, can we actually generate new materials, new fuels that will actually enable the next generation of nuclear reactor systems to be built, and also to do it in a much faster and much more efficient way than we've been doing in the past. One of the things that became apparent as we listened to all of the different groups is that when you look at what's going to happen in the reactor system, we're going to be dealing with timescales that go all the way from reactions happening in a timescale of 10 to the minus 17 seconds. You're then going to let them go for seconds, minutes, days, weeks, decades, and multiple decades if we're actually to realize the design of the next generation reactor. And just one example that come up from just the simple radiolysis of water, the first reaction, the first ionization reaction happens in 10 to the minus 17 seconds. By 10 to the minus seven seconds, you've now got products in your, in your water. Uh, you've got the OH there, you've got the peroxides there. They're going, those reactions are going to take place in about 10 to the minus seven seconds. The impact of having those, those radicals there is going to affect corrosion throughout the lifetime of the reactor system. Right, so you've just gone from 10 to the minus 17, 10 to the minus 7, up to probably 70, 80 to 100 years. We have to try and figure out how we're going to design materials that will actually tolerate that system. Our problem also gets more challenging because if we ask well, if we, put, if we know the starting material really well and we can model it and we can predict its behavior, can we predict what it's going to do 100 years? The answer is no, because the starting state doesn't last for very long. It's going to be continuously evolving and changing. And we have to be able to follow those changes and then say what those changes are going to do to the properties of the material. So here's just one example that's shown on the right here. It says you've got the, if you look at the restructuring of UO2 during, due to burn up, you start with nice large grains at the beginning, but now you end up with submicron grains and large bubbles. And you have to be able to tell how that structure evolved and how it's going to impact the properties. So I think the challenge is when we try and say we're going to not only develop the new materials, the new fuels, we're going to have to be able to predict how they're going to perform throughout the entire reactor lifetime. It's quite a challenge since everything is dynamic. So let me take you through the PRDs and I'll give you some examples of the future research topics that, that come up and show you some of the enthusiasm and excitement uh, that we had. But if we look just at the molten salts, uh, either being used as a coolant or as a liquid fuel, I said, what do we have to do there? Well, the main challenge that we want to do is, can we characterize and predict the structure, the dynamics and energetics of these molten salts, and taking into account the fact that they're always going to be constantly evolving? So if we take a simulations and say, well, now we have to think of how's that liquid going to interact with the rest of the system? Do we have the right kind of simulations, the right kind of modeling tools to get the charge transfer right, to get the interactions right? And oh, by the way, you now have to put impurities into that liquid and determine how those impurities are going to not only affect the performance of the coolant liquid or the coolant fuel, you're now going to have to predict the performance of those impurities on the rest of the system. So you can't just stay with that initial state. 
So some of the things that we're going to have to look at, even as something as simple as getting thermodynamic models and thermodynamic phase diagrams of the salts, we don't have these these days. But we're actually going to need them, especially if we're going to understand what those contaminants are going to do. One of the things that was quite common throughout uh, the entire workshop was that people were developing new tools and new capabilities to come to facilities like APS or to go to the other DOE facilities and actually do new science and get insights into these. What you see over on the right is you'll see some uh, XF spectra and you'll see down below it, you'll see the chamber that was actually built in order to enable this work to be done. So it's an exciting chamber, right? Because now you've got a high temperature cell. It's got a capability up to 1,000 C. It is protective, and you can actually put radioactive materials in it. All the design was done so they can then fit inside the APS. But now you can actually start looking and get uh, information about the, uh, the anionic co complexes that are formed uh, this one wasn't during a radiation, but you can, in fact, go ahead and do that now. I think that's an exciting development. One of the other areas that we put, said that we need to do is we actually have to figure out how we can do materials design, not only from lab scale, but up to an industrial scale. We also have to then say, how is that material going to perform during the lifetime of the reactor? We can't stay with the approaches we've been using, and most of it's being, well, we should add these elements to the steel that we're using, and that should improve the properties. And then let's go through a very long testing campaign to see if they work. Remember, if we're going to actually build these new reactors and expect them to perform for 100 years, we're going to have to do accelerated testing and be confident that our accelerating testing gives us the right performance. Today we can't do that, but in the future we will. One example of where we know that we can exchange uh, the properties is, could we make a material that's somewhat self-healing? In other words, it doesn't accumulate damage in the way that we think of a traditional reactor material. One of the new areas is to change not just the sink density, but to change the compositional complexity. So by that, I mean what we're going to do is we're going to add multiple elements. We're going to add three, four, or five. We're going to put them all in the same atomic ratio. It's very different than how we normally think of, of building a new alloy. What you actually see at the very bottom is if you take nickel, nickel, cobalt, nickel, cobalt, chrome, and then the four element alloy, you'll notice that the void swelling is very different. The four element alloy shows almost no void swelling. It's quite impressive. But today, if you actually were to say, can we use simulations in order to predict that behavior? The answer is no. The potentials that we have today will only work if you are looking at maybe two element systems, maybe a three element system if you're lucky. It's never going to go into a four element or a five element or a six element system. But if that's really where the advance is, we need the new algorithms and new potentials in order to explore that area. If we look at some of the changes in fuels, one of the things that you would want to do is control uh, the specific heat. One of the things we do know that if you add nanoparticles to it, you can control the specific heat. So, this example that you see down here just shows the enhancement of molten salt specific heats through adding nanomaterials. So now think of your fuel as being encapsulated in a nanocapsule. Is that going to have different properties? Or if it's in the coolant, what's that going to do? Again, we cannot do the experiments and just keep trying the experiments. We're going to need simulation tools that will actually allow us to simulate the performance. One of the common themes that came up throughout our entire talk or in the entire workshop is we realized that interfaces were incredibly important. That interface might be between a, a liquid and a solid. It might be between a gas and a solid. It might be between a solid and a solid. We have to figure out how those interfaces can be tailored, how we can manipulate them in order to get the properties that we desire. Now, one of the things that we have to be careful about is that 
you know, if you do radiation-induced processes at the near interfaces, uh, they're going to actually change the radiolysis that you get at those interfaces. You're going to find that you get species that you weren't expecting. You're going to find that they're coming out in higher percentages than you should because they've been enhanced and accelerated by the radiation. And when you do this, this changes how the interaction with the interface is going to occur. So just to give you an example, if you look at the three images down on the bottom, this is just alloy 690 in supercritical water, and it's just looking at the oxidation states that you get. So the one on the far left shows you a grain boundary, and what you see there is that you get a very interesting oxide forming coming off the grain boundary. If you look at the 111 oriented grain, you'll see the, ox the shape of the oxide particles that are growing on that. If you look just at a random grain, you'll see that you get a very different particle forming on top of it. We don't know today why it's orientation dependent. But if you were to look down beneath this oxide layer, you'll find that it's now eating away at the base material or it's causing segregation effects different in each grain. So if we are to design a polycrystalline material that we will put in a reactor, we need to understand how surfaces, how those surface reactions control the properties. Because also, if you think about it, some of these look more porous than others. If they're more porous, it means more of your, your coolant is getting access to the base metal. That's a bad thing. We don't understand how to control it. One of the other parts that came clear is that uh, when you think of some interfaces, they actually have two properties. Sometimes it's a beneficial property, sometimes it's a detrimental property. Even something as simple as grain boundaries, when we think about them and we do deformation of the system, sometimes the grain boundaries are, act as sources of the dislocations that we have. Sometimes they act as sinks. Same is true if it's segregants. Sometimes it will take in the, the defects, it will take in the elements, sometimes it will segregate them out. So it's always changing. We don't understand how to control and manipulate that. We do know that if we have a very high sink density there, that you will take up all of the point defects. And that, an example of that is just shown on the bottom right, and it's very hard to see any of the damage that's in there, and that's because it's, there's not a lot of damage left because it's all been taken up by the copper, the, co the copper niobium interfaces. We don't know how to actually make systems that we could then put and construct a reactor out with all of these interfaces to soak up the defects. But if we are to make a self-healing material, we need to understand these processes, not only from a science point of view, from a physics point of view, but now we're going to have to process them. It's no good just saying they're good in a the computer, they're good in a the lab experiment, how do you scale something like this up to actually make a massive structure that you'd actually use for a construction project? We don't know how to do that today. One of the other things that was clear is that we are inventing new tools and new capabilities to actually explore uh, different types of reactions that are important. The image that you see in the center is again an example from corrosion, but this time it's in situ, it's confocal microscopy, and of course the grains have been artificially colored, but again what you notice that each grain has been consumed at a very different rate. Why is that? We don't understand what controls it, but again it's something that we need to do. I mentioned at the beginning that one of the key features that came out, and this is part of the PRD4, is that we must learn how to bridge across scales, both spatial scales, they're going to go from the atomic level all the way up to the continuum level, to the large component level. We must be able to do that. We've always talked about multi-scale modeling. We need to actually get to a reality where we can use DFT to inform the next scale level, we can use that to inform the next one and so on. It's something that we must learn how to do. At the same time, we must also begin to appreciate that if we're doing, looking at it experimentally, it's no longer good enough just to look at one length scale, 
and then try and predict what's happening at the atomic level, we need to take a multi-scale experimental approach to try and understand the processes. And again, if we just take the example of corrosion, most of us are probably used to looking at component failure, and that, that's what we would consider. And maybe that's at the 10 millimeter lens scale. But if you actually want to look at what's happening on the surface, what those reaction products are, what led to the corrosion event, then you're going to have to start looking, say, at the micro scale and look at the surface defects. Ultimately, you're actually going to have to go down to the atomic scale and see how things have been evolving. So today we have all those capabilities, but normally we only apply one to the problem. A clear suggestion from the meeting was it's time that we applied the multi-scale modeling or multi-scale experimental approach to tackle the problem. The other part is don't do it without the simulations. You need the simulations to help inform and interpret your experimental data. So you need to couple the two together. Don't do them in isolation. So just to sort of hit back on that point, here's the multi-scale simulation that we must extend over. It's critical that we learn how to work across the scales. It's absolutely essential that we figure out how to get the experimentalists and the simulation teams working together if we are to address these kind of complex problems. One of the things that we also realized is that most of the failures, we can't predict when they're going to happen. And the reason we can't predict that when they're going to happen, most of them have occurred because there's a rare event that happens. We, we've never been able to trigger, catch what triggers that rare event but that's a part of the science that we must get to if we are going to be able to mitigate against that failure. All of us look at the aggregate behavior and we tend to forget that there's that one little event that triggered the failure. So the example that you see on the slide is a radiation assisted stress corrosion cracking. It's a simple stainless steel. The white bands that you see coming down towards the grain boundary they're the deformation bands. They're the dislocation channels that we all know exist in these materials. But here you see seven or eight channels all hitting the same boundary, none of them transmitting across the grain boundary. And I would challenge anyone this of us to, or in this room to actually predict which one of those intersections with the grain boundary was, was the failure site. You can see it here, but we can't predict what's different. Right, just to show you that it does crack, there you can see the crack right at that intersection point. But what was special about that one location? We don't know. But if we are to tackle the corrosion event and stop it happening and stop getting a critical crack to form, we need to be able to predict the rare events. Just one other example of a rare event, very simple this time, if we think of nucleation of growth of phases in a system, think of the competition between is it going to nucleate or is the first nuclear, the first site going to actually grow? Do we actually know what triggers the nucleation event? And I'd say in most cases we still don't understand what will trigger and put one site in favor of another. But it is something we need to understand if we're going to look forward to being able to predict the performance the fuels, the coolants, and then the structural materials in these systems. The other part that came very clear and was common across all of this, and I hope I've hinted at it, is that we need new computational tools and capabilities. We need to generate the next generation of algorithms, next generation of potentials that will actually allow us to go in for their complex alloys. There's huge promise as exascale computing comes online. Will we be able to follow and go beyond a few hundred thousand atoms to where you're maybe doing trillions of atoms? Will we be able to go, go beyond time scales that are still, what, nanoseconds? Will we be able to go to real temperatures and use computing to actually direct where we're going? We think with the exascale computing coming online, we will be able to do that. Machine learning, as it comes online, if we employ it to look at some of these problems, I think we can answer them. Again, what was clear out of this whole process is that 
We must link experiments to computational methods. We must use the experiments to inform the computational models and where they must go. And we must use the computational models to inform and interpret the experiments. Hand in hand, I think we can actually solve the problem. So this is where we are. This is the, the first report out of what we covered, uh, the BRN and the future of nuclear materials. Thank you for your attention, and I'll be happy to take any questions.